Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm so glad you're here. And what I want to talk about tonight is God in ancient China. I'm going to present you some things that might be new to you because most people have certain concepts or understanding of Chinese belief system. So I know that my material will be new to you, so I ask for your patience and also let me finish my whole presentation before you make a conclusion. First of all, this is my family. Uh, I have one daughter and two sons and uh, a son-in-law. My daughter actually just got married a week ago. But I am from a traditional Chinese family, uh, fourth generation. My great-grandmother went to Singapore from Guangdong province. And because of that, I grew up in a very traditional Chinese family and we worship idols. And when I became a Christian at 19 years old in 1974, I was made to believe that I have turned my back on my culture, that I am no longer a Chinese because now I'm a Christian. So for many years, I accepted that as maybe a price to be paid for being a Christian. But in the 1987, my wife and I, we moved to Beijing to work and uh, it was there that I made some discoveries and the result is what I'm about to present to you tonight and uh, most of these materials are in the book that I have written called Faith of Our Fathers. My thesis, what I want to present to you tonight is that ancient Chinese once worshipped a personal and relational God who rules lovingly and justly through his regent. His regent meaning the emperor. And the ancient Chinese also believe and practice vicarious sacrifice to maintain their relationship to this personal God. Okay, so this is new, but this is my thesis. This is my, what I want to present to you and I will show you my arguments. My argument is based on this, what I want to present tonight in my book, I cover more areas, but tonight I want to present to you the imperial sacrificial system and the concepts of God found in ancient Chinese documents, records and interpretations of extra events, meaning events that happen in the sky, and then expert opinions of the 17th and 18th century and then finally, I want to share with you ancient ideologies embedded in the Chinese written character. But first of all, some background. Now, when you think of Confucius, you probably think of him as the beginning of Chinese history, right? That he's at the very beginning of Chinese history. But I want to show you and maybe to remind you that Confucius actually came in quite late in Chinese history, 6th century BC. And that is half time, because before Confucius, there was 2,000 years of Chinese history already. And then, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, you can refer to these various things I'm going to talk about. So this kind of uh, help you put things where they are. Okay, first of all, I want to talk about the God that the ancient Chinese worship. And once again, I am talking about a period way before Confucius. I'm talking about the very beginning of Chinese civilization, and they worship one God. And they call this God as one greater than great. Okay, this is a Chinese character for great, you know, a man with outstretched arms. Tian or heaven is one greater than great. That is the God that the ancient Chinese worship. Tian, heaven, is similar to the English word. It can mean the sky, but it can also mean God. Same in Chinese, Tian can mean the sky, the natural sky. But actually in ancient China, the ancient Chinese writings referred more to the God. Because, for example, Confucius says, he who offends heaven has none to whom he can pray. You don't offend the natural sky, okay? You offend a person. And then in another place, this is a very famous saying of Confucius. He said, at 15, 
I had my mind bent on learning. At 30, I stood firm. At 40, I had no doubts. At 50, I knew the mandates of heaven. At 60, my ear was an obedient organ for the reception of truth. At 70, I could follow what my heart desired without transgressing what was right. But the point here is the mandate of heaven. In other words, the will of God. And obviously, Confucius is not talking about natural laws as in the natural sky. He is talking about a person who has a will, and that's why it took him until 50 years old to begin to understand the will of God. Okay, so first thing here, heaven, Tian, is a reference to this God. But there is another term for God in ancient China, is Shang Di. Literally, it means the Lord on high, or the highest Lord. Shangti and heaven, Shangti and Tian are two names of one God. It was made clear by Zhen Xuan, the uh, historian in the Han Dynasty. He said, Shangti is another name for heaven. Take note, he says, the spirits do not have two lords. So Zhen Xuan understood, as well as the ancient Chinese, that there is a spiritual world, and the one who rules over all is Shangti or Tian. Just like uh, Christians or Hebrews give different names to God, you have Elohim and Yahweh and Adonai. So in the same way, ancient Chinese use two terms for God, sometimes Tian, sometimes Shanti. Okay, these are two experts who talk about this Shanti or Tian. First of all, they came to the conclusion that Shanti is not an abstract idea, and I will prove it, but I want to quote you what the expert said. This, this is a foremost expert on Chinese and Chinese history and culture, Dr. Mel Hurst. He said, in no case do we find Shanti exhibited under any figurative representations. In other words, Shanti is not an abstract idea. Indeed, we are warned against confounding him with the images in the temples. So, Shangti worship is not idolatry because the Chinese never make an image of Shangti. You will not find it anywhere. Now, while the supreme ruler is declared again and again to be distinct from the visible heavens, the main idea attached to Shangti is universal supremacy, uncontrollable power, justice, glory, majesty, and dominion. Another expert considered the foremost Chinese expert in the 19th century, even by the top Chinese expert at that time, Huang Tao, uh, no, Huang, uh, Wang Tao, James Lake. James Lake said, but the Chinese stand out distinctly from all other hidden nations in these two points, that their representations of Shangdi, you notice a different spelling, but this was the old uh, way of uh, phoneticizing or Latinizing Chinese, are consistent throughout, and that they never raise any other being to an approximation to him. In other words, the Shangti that the ancient Chinese worship, it's supreme. There is no close second. There's no other person that the ancient Chinese worship. In other words, the Chinese had a monotheistic faith. He is always the same, the creator and sovereign ruler, holy and just and good, and no other is ever made equal or second to him. He has no rival. And now we go into the Chinese classics. Um, you will find that the name Shangti is mentioned about 175 times in the Sisu Wu Jin, the, the, what would be considered the classics of the Chinese. And these are the things that you will find. These are attributes. Now, for Christian, we study God, and it's called systematic theology, and we classify God's attributes in two ways. One, we call natural attributes, meaning that these are attributes that only God has. And then the second category are what we call moral attributes. These are the attributes that God shares with human, and I will share with you. So, first of all, we are going to look at His natural attribute. And these are similar to the God of the Bible. 
It says here in the book of, in the classic of history, Shang Su, the conclusive appointment of heaven rests on your person. This is referring to the emperor. You must eventually ascend the throne of the great sovereign. In other words, God is sovereign, Shang Di is sovereign in that he appoints the rulers of China. He is sovereign, we can see in another place, O bright and high heaven, who enlightens and rules this lower world. So Shangti is sovereign in that he rules the world. And then we know that Shangti is sovereign because the mandate was from heaven. This is a mandate of heaven, mandating the throne to King Wen. This is King Wen of the Zhou Dynasty, establishing his capital and the Zhou Dynasty. So once again, God, Shangti, Tian is sovereign. He decides who rules. And the Chinese also understood that heaven or Tian and, and Shangti is eternal. Qin Wen lives above, his virtues shine in heaven. Though our Zhou nation is old, God's mandate is still with us. The Zhou nation was not established when the time of Di's mandate had not arrived. Qin Wen's soul is active and he lives in the presence of Shangdi. Now, I'm inferring here, but the point here is that the ancient Chinese believed that King Wen continued to live and he lives in the presence of God, Shangdi. So it is a reference to the eternity of God. Just as King Wen has not died, God has been present throughout. And then Shangdi is immutable. In other words, he cannot change. Only Shangdi is inscrutable. In other words, only God cannot be understood fully but he will shower blessings on those who do, who do good. He will pour down calamities on those who do evil. We must not neglect to do small acts of righteousness because it is by the accumulation of these do the nations celebrate. We must not neglect to avoid small acts of unrighteousness because it is by the accumulation of these that an entire generation is corrupted. Now, again, this is by inference that God is immutable in that he is consistent with his character. All right, he will uh, reward those who do good and he will punish those who do wrong over a period of time, not immediately, but over a period of time. Now, for those of you who are still observer, you will notice that there's a lot of English and just some short Chinese. First of all, it's because the Chinese is classical Chinese, which is very succinct. But the other thing is that the English is an expanded version, and most of my translation came from James Lake. James Lake spent 25 years to translate the entire series of Chinese classics. His translation had been deemed to be most authoritative by the experts at that time. Some Chinese scholars today will dispute with what I share, which is true, because the interpretation, of course, there can be different ones. But I am standing on very good authority, and this is the reason why. First of all, classical Chinese is no longer in use today, even by the scholars. They only do it as an academic exercise. Whereas during the time of James Lake and the Chinese authorities at that time, classical Chinese was what they used in the written form daily. So the... Uh, when, when the uh, top Chinese expert, Wang Tao, said that James Lake's translation was accurate, we can believe him. The other thing that uh, I want to point out is that I use uh, James Lake's translation because James Lake, as a very top-notch scholar, would annotate his translation. He would explain why he translate this word that way versus the other way. Most Chinese scholars do not have the discipline to do that. They will just give you a translation without meticulously explaining how they come to that conclusion, whereas James Lake will do that. Okay? Another reason that I uh, stand on James Lake's translation is that some of you may know, during the Boxer Rebellion, the Hanlin Academy was burnt by the boxers. The Hanlin Academy is equivalent to the Library of Congress, where most of Chinese classics and, and very important documents uh, were kept, and they were burnt. So these documents are actually no longer accessible to modern experts, whereas 
at that time, these were available to people like James Lake. Okay, and then moving on, Tian or Shangdi is all powerful as the ancient Chinese understood him. The descendants of Shang dynasty were in number more than hundreds of thousands, but when Shangdi gave the command, they became subject to Zhou dynasty. So the whole idea is God is powerful, he could overcome a great dynasty like Shang and replace it with the Zhou dynasty. And God is all powerful, as we can see in this passage uh, from the classic of history. Almighty heaven has given this middle kingdom, Zhongguo, with its people and territories to the former kings. Again, God is powerful in that he could move uh, kingdoms here and there. And then Shangdi is all knowing. Heaven is all intelligent and observing, and let the godly emperor imitate him. Then his ministers will honor him, and the people will be governed well. So, in other words, follow the example of Shangdi, who is very intelligent. Uh, Shangdi or Tian is all knowing. We know that from this uh, passage. Oh, Almighty Shangdi, you come to us in your majesty. You discern all that is happening for the peace of the people. So, again, he is discerning, he is all knowing. Then Shangdi is also ever present. Shangdi is revered because he will extend to the nine limits. He is everywhere, so he is ever present. And Shangdi is infinite. Only the mandate of heaven is absolute and eternal, majesty and infinite. Heaven, Shangdi is infinite. O oh, vast and great heaven, who are called our parent. Some of you are starting to wonder, how come these are not known to us? Well, it's because um, most uh, Chinese today neglect the classics. I went to the Xinhua Sudian in Beijing one day. I wanted to buy a copy of Li Ji, one of the classics, the Book of Rites. And I asked the lady at the counter, I said, I want to buy a copy of Li Ji. And she said, who is the author? <laughs> you know, it's like walking into the uh, bookstore and you say, I want to buy a Bible, and the counter person asks you, who is the author? So I said, you have no idea? She says, I've never heard of it before. Can you imagine a person who works in the bookstore that had never heard one of the Chinese classics? But anyway, uh, this sounds new to you, but it has been there for a few thousand years. Heaven loves the people. Okay, now we're moving into the moral attributes of God. Ever present, ever knowing. Those are called natural attributes. Only God is ever present. Only God is all knowing. But He shares some of His characteristics with us. So now we're moving into that. And so the first of that is Shangdi is love. Heaven loves the people. The ruler should honor heaven. This is a very important point because uh, Chinese who worship idols never think of God, they are, their idols as loving, right? They, they never think of having a love relationship with the idols. They worship their idols because they want to get something from the idols uh, for protection. Maybe they want a wife or they want a beautiful child, they want to pass the exam or they want to win the lottery, but they never think of a loving relationship with the idols. Whereas ancient Chinese, this is a very fundamental concept that because God loves the Chinese people, that God will always appoint good rulers to rule them. And how do they know that this ruler is not from God? When he no longer exhibits God's character, and then they can change the mandate so the Chinese word for the change of mandate is the word for revolution, ge min. Because the mandate is God's will. And a person, a ruler, can only become the ruler of China when he has the mandate, the tian min, from God. When he no longer has that mandate, when he doesn't exhibit the character of God, when he doesn't love the Chinese people, then the people can... That you can act the will of God. This is very powerful. This is a very important concept. 
And uh, more to say, how do we know that heaven loves the people of the world? Because he enlightens them universally. Heaven, Shanti, is holy. Again, if you look at Chinese uh, worship, uh, idolatry, they never think of uh, their idol to be holy. In fact, the most devout uh, worshipper of Chinese idols are the Chinese mafia. Uh, it is virtue that moves heaven. There is no distance to which it does not reach. Pride brings loss, humility brings reward. This is the way of heaven. So in other words, God is holy. He is supreme in his character. He is above all else. He is beyond reach in terms of his moral standards. Now, Shanti is holy because among the ancients who exemplified this fear, and this is a fear of the holy God, there was the founder of Xia dynasty, uh, Da Yu. When his house was at its strength, he sought for able men to honor Shangdi. And then, heaven, Shangdi is gracious. In other words, he, is, he grants us favors. Great heaven has graciously favored the house of Shang and granted to you, O young king, at last to become virtuous. This is truly a great thing for generations to come. And we also know that Shangti is gracious because there is peace throughout our numerous regions. There has been a succession of plentiful years. Heaven does not weary in its favour. In other words, God's favour is continuous. He doesn't get tired of favouring us. And then, Shangti, and finally, is faithful. The ordinances of heaven, how deep are they and unceasing? God is faithful in that He will always keep His promises. He will keep to His ordinances. And then in the book of Man uh, Means, Mansha said that faithfulness is the way of heaven. To be faithful is a man's way. We are called to be faithful because God is faithful. So these are the attributes um, of heaven. And then finally, Heaven took notice of his virtue and entrusted his great mandate on him that he should come and settle the great number of regions. So these are the attributes of the sovereign God that the ancient Chinese understood. Notice here, they describe this God, but they never make an image. This is very much like biblical worship. When we read the Bible, we start to see and know God. But we don't look at an image, we look at his attributes to know God. It's a very common thing for Chinese to, when you share with them, and they will say, show me God. You know, if God is real, I want to see him. I will point them to this, to the ancient Chinese. Because you can, you can know a person by his character, right? So when they think about seeing God, they want to see eye to eye. I say, no need, because our forefathers, ancient Chinese understood God. And if you look into the ancient Chinese classics, you have an idea of who God is. The second evidence I want to present, the first one are the documentary proofs. And now it's the longest and most continuous religious practice in China. This is the one religious practice that had lasted for a few millennia. It started when the Chinese civilization started. There is not a point in Chinese history that say, oh, they started to do this. It is assumed it was there from the very beginning of ancient China, and it only stopped officially in 1911. And why 1911? Because Sun Yat-sen, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, overthrew the, di the Qing dynasty and ushered in a republic. So it was only in 1911 that this uh, practice stopped, but not even then that it stopped, in 1914, this sacrifice was performed by who? Yuan Shikai. All right, Yuan Shikai, who usurped the, the authority, uh, he wanted to return to the dynasty. So the first thing he did, of course, he performed a border sacrifice. And I have a personal uh, information. Uh, I, I, I cannot document it, but I will just share with you that someone told me that Chairman Mao also performed a sacrifice after he took over China. 
just in case. And the person responsible for it was a minister from the Qing dynasty. But anyway, so this is it, the border sacrifice. Now, why is it called border sacrifice? Jiao Ji, because it was performed at the outskirts of the city. It had to be done outside the city. Jiao Wai, okay, in the, outside the, the, the city wall. Now, that is actually consistent with the biblical sacrificial system. So, from the very beginning, you see that similarity. Now, this is what I talked about. Throughout Chinese history, they talked about this border sacrifice as if it should be there. In ancient times, the son of heaven, that is the emperor, of the Xia dynasty, Xia is considered the first dynasty of China, the first three dynasties, Xia, Shang, Zhou, the first is Xia, personally and reverentially sacrificed to Shangdi at the border. That's why it is called the border sacrifice. This is a most sacred responsibility that no Chinese dynasty has ever failed to perform. Every Chinese emperor has to perform this sacrifice. That's why I say it is the longest survive, uh, continuous sacrifice. Now, maybe the emperor didn't believe uh, what is said in that, and afterwards I will touch on that too, the meaning of the sacrifice. But they had to do it because, remember, the mandate of heaven, Tian Min. An emperor can only rule when he has the mandate. If he does not have a relationship with God, it proves to the people he really doesn't have the mandate. I mean, this is similar to US presidents, right? Right before election, they will attend church more regularly and they will show people that they are in church. So in the same way, the Chinese emperor had to perform this sacrifice. Okay, the purpose of the sacrifice According to the doctrine of Min or the Book of Min, the ceremonies of the celestial, celestial and terrestrial sacrifices are those by which man serve Shangti. So the sacrifice is a service to God. And not only that, the sacrifice has significance. It is said to an emperor. The most important thing is to follow the principles of heaven. In following heaven, nothing is more important than the border sacrifice. So this is the most sacred task of the ancient emperors. It is recorded that way in the Chinese historical record. And then, to go further, the Book of Rites, that's a book I was trying to get in the, uh, in the, in the bookstore. It says, to on, uh, the honour of the rites, or to honour the rites, is to honour the meaning intended in it. If the meaning is lost, then the sacrifices are simply presented as a national celebration. So the requirements can be fulfilled, but its meaning is not easily understood. The emperor who understands the meaning and practices it, he will be able to rule the nation. So from here, very clearly, it says that the sacrifice has a deeper meaning. It is not easily understood. It's not just what you see on the outside. And it goes so far to say that the emperor who understands the meaning of the sacrifice will be able to rule the nation. China is a very large nation, even at that time, to rule that many people. And here it says, if you understand the sacrifice, you'll be able to rule the nation. Wow! You know, if there's one secret to ruling the nation, I think the Chinese emperors will rush to it, and this is it. Okay, what is that meaning? I want to suggest to you, the meaning involves in servant leadership, it involves in self-sacrifice on the part of the ruler and it involves, more importantly, substitutionary death or vicarious substitution. A seven-year famine happened around the time of Shang Tang, the first emperor of the Shang dynasty. The famine lasted for seven years. They tried everything to please God. They offered all kinds of sacrifices, but the, the drought went on and on. You know, LA is having a drought for four years, and I think you're feeling the pain. But imagine in those days, uh, without modern uh, irrigation and, and transportation, 
uh, they were suffering, they were hurting. So the ministers came to Shang Tang and said to him, we must do something exceptional, we must offer a human sacrifice. Now you have to understand that in ancient China, human sacrifice was never institutionalized. Yes, when the emperors died, some of them will bury their concubines, and even rich people do uh, too. And, and, but it is not related to the worship of Shangdi. There is never a record of human sacrifice like some other pagan religion. Uh, so this is surprising that the people would suggest this to Shangtang, and it shows you how desperate they were that they would think of something so exceptional. But a greater surprise was that Shang Tang actually agreed. He said, okay, let's do it against all the rules. He said, yes, we will offer a human. So they set a place at the mulberry bush and a time. And then a bigger surprise awaited everyone. When they showed up at the place at the right time, they found Shang Tang prepared himself to be sacrificed. He himself was to be the sacrificial person. He dressed himself, he bathed himself, he trimmed his nails and put on the sackcloth. And then he prayed this very famous prayer. He said, I have seen. The people have no part in it. If, however, the people have seen, the offences must also rest upon me. Please, do not let one person's lack of virtue cause Shangdi and the spirits to destroy the lives of the people. This is found in the Louis Chronicle, Lui Si Chun Xiu. This is a historical record. This is a historical prayer. What does it tell us? It tells us that ancient Chinese, going back to almost 2,000 years before Christ, understood that one person can die on behalf of others. This is what we call vicarious substitution. It is clearly a Christian doctrine. One person can die for everybody else. And we know that this body, uh, a border sacrifice was carried out by all the dynasties. If you go to the Temple of Heaven complex in Beijing, you will see uh, they present to you all these uh, historical records that how it all came about throughout the ages. And we have found other uh, altar mounds beside the one that you can see in Beijing. For example, this one in Xi'an was discovered and restored. Of course, Xi'an was a capital for the Tang Dynasty. But this is the uh, altar of heaven complex, uh, first built in 1420. Now, I want to say something here. You notice I use the word altar of heaven. Uh, the English term temple of heaven is a mistranslation because the Chinese word for this is Tian Tan. Tan is altar. If it is temple, it would be what? Tian Miao. But the Chinese understood that you don't build a building for the Creator God. He is far greater than human hands can put a house together for Him. A miao, as it is explained in Chinese uh, history, and if you are interested in all the references, I have it in my book. Miao comes from mao, mian mao, the mao, image. So the Chinese say, miao, mao ye, meaning the word miao, temple, comes from image. So a temple is a place where you put an image. But the altar of heaven is not called tian miao, it's called an altar. Okay, uh, this is a layout of it, and I will touch on a few places. But this is a, a very interesting proclamation. Six days before the sacrifice, the emperor would make a proclamation. But this proclamation is directed to the spirits, not to people. Okay, the emperor knew that there is a spiritual world. So he says, on the first day of the coming month, I, Zhen, 
shall reverently lead my officers and people to honour the great name Shangdi, dwelling in the sovereign heavens, looking up to that nice, storied, lofty blue sky. Beforehand, I inform you, all you celestial and all you terrestrial spirits, and will trouble you on our behalf to exert your spiritual influences and display your vigorous efficacy, communicating our poor desire to Shangdi and praying him mercifully to grant us his acceptance and regard and to be pleased with the title which we shall reverently present. For this purpose, I have made this proclamation for your information. All you spirits should be well aware of it. You are seriously informed. Few things here. I want you to note, first of all, the, Chinese, the emperor addressed to himself is Chen. This is the superlative form of I. Only the emperor could use that. But immediately you can see the emperor considered himself superior or inferior to the spirits. Superior, okay? The emperor sees himself superior to the spirits, Gui Shen. And some people say, wow, you know, uh, Christians don't believe in that. It's not true. If you read the, the Psalms, uh, for example, Psalm 103, David actually called everybody, the spirits even, to come and worship with him. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all those who has been blessed his holy name. So in the same way, the emperor of China called upon the spiritual world to join him in this very important worship. And this is the Chinese... Um, original text. Okay, and on winter solstice, the shortest year of the, uh, short, sorry, the shortest day of the year, the beginning of the year, uh, the, uh, from then on, the, the days will get longer. So, uh, it will be considered, you know, the yin yang, so this will be considered the beginning of the yang part of the year. The emperor and his entourage, usually a few thousand in number, will arrive in the temple of heaven on the day of winter solstice. And this is part of the entourage. This is one-tenth of the whole picture you can find in the Forbidden City. There's no room. If I put the whole thing down here, you will see only very tiny figures. But this is the procession. And the emperor will enter into the uh, first place he goes to. It's the uh, hall of abstinence or the prayer hall where he will actually clean, him, uh, clean himself and change into his sacrificial uh, garment. He will take off his uh, emperor's clothing and assume the role of the high priest for the Chinese people. And outside the prayer hall, you will see this uh, sort of a pavilion. And during the sacrificial period, this bronze statue will be placed there. Now take note, this is not an idol. There is a history to that. Because during this time, the emperor is supposed to be in prayer and contemplation. He's supposed to get himself ready. All right? He would have been fasting for three days. He would fast from meat. He would fast from women. And he would also fast from doing business. And all those few thousand officials who would join in the ceremony would do the same. They would fast from women. They were fast from meat. They were also fast from doing business. So during those few days, the ministers and those involved usually stay in their offices. They don't go home. You know why? To prove that they had no relations with their wives or concubines. Okay? They stay away from women. And they also do not do any business. But not all the emperor were uh, following the rules. So once an emperor was fooling around, but his chief minister scolded him and reminded him that he should be worshipping God and contemplating and be in fasting and prayer. So from then on, the emperor would put this statue up. You notice a hand like this because there will be a sign that is placed there to remind the emperor that he is to worship God in those days. And then that afternoon, the day before winter solstice, that afternoon the emperor will come into the imperial vault of heaven. It's called the imperial vault because this is the place where he will keep the name tablet for Shangdi. 
Remember, I tell you there is no images, but they do have a tablet. And this is the tablet, if you see, uh, placed elevated so that the emperor is much lower than the tablet. And the emperor will come and inspect the tablet to make sure everything is in order. This is a name tablet for the God Most High. And you'll notice there are two scripts on the right. It's the Han script, the Chinese script. And on the left is the Manchurian script because the last dynasty of China was the Qing dynasty. They added that. But before that, they only had the Han script. But this is the God that the ancient Chinese worship, Huang Tian Shang Di. Huang means August, means great. Okay? So the Supreme Lord in the highest heaven. Now, just as an aside, very interestingly, very interestingly, when the first emperor of the Qing dynasty, Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of the Qing dynasty, when he reunited China, he wanted a new title for himself. He asked his ministers and they suggested, someone say, Ba Wang. He says, no, I don't like that. So he came up with one term himself. What did he call himself? Huang Di. I believe it comes from Huang Tian Shang Di. This was the emperor who actually usurped the role of God in the lives of the Chinese people. He burned the books and buried the Confucian scholars because the, the, the writings of God that I shared with you early on are all written in the script. So he burned those books and he killed the Confucius scholars and he was a very violent emperor because he wanted to replace God. Okay, and sacrificial animals are used and uh, there are so many details here but I just want to highlight a few very important ones. Um, Later, I'm going to talk about the sacrificial animal in characters. But one thing here is that they have very clear prescription of what kind of animals to be used. Got to be pure in colour, got to be unblemished, and even the size of the horn uh, are to be calculated. And these are replicas that you can still see in the uh, Altar of Heaven complex. Uh, they use unblemished, perfect animals for the sacrifice. Music was very important during the time of Qianlong. Uh, 2,000 musicians were uh, kept there for the sacrifice. Now, it was said that the musicians that the, uh, that the emperor used for this sacrifice were never mixed with his own entertainment. In other words, when these musicians perform, they are always performing to Shangdi, never mixed with the emperor's personal entertainment. And this is the Restored Music Conservatory. Uh, you can still see it. Most people miss it. It's on the uh, western side of the complex. And in it, a few years ago, I conducted a concert there with uh, Xiaomin, Sister Xiaomin Song. And, but while we were there, uh, I, I, I discovered that there is this animal, and then you see on the back of the animal, different coloured cards, different heights. There's a symbol to it. After the sacred music had been performed, the chief minister will use the brush to brush the animal with the cards. It is a symbol that there is injustice in the world. But God will wipe them all clean, all equal. God will level the playing field, so to speak. So, so this is a very important uh, symbol. It shows you that this sacrifice, this worship, it's about the common people and it's about God bringing peace on earth. The main sacrifice would be performed on the circular mount, the altar. It's a three-tier altar and it will, would perform seven quarters before sunrise on winter solstice. Now, winter solstice is around December 21, and it is probably the coldest day of the year, <laughs> okay? At seven quarters before sunrise, can you imagine many times would be below freezing, and the emperor and his ministers will come. So this is serious business. It was said that the Ming Dynasty emperors did not even wear shoes. Of course, they wear socks, but they would not wear shoes to the sacrifice. So, the whole place would be lit up, 
and the emperor would stand in this is the top tier and the top tier it's a place reserved for Shangdi and the tablet of God is position number one that tablet I showed you early on at the imperial vault and then the officiating minister will be standing here and then position 17 is where the emperor would stand but he will ascend to position number five position number five is right where afterwards I'll show you the round stone those of you who have been to the altar of heaven will know that's called Tong Tian Shi there's a stone that goes to heaven uh, the emperor would come up here nine times because this is a nine part ceremony and the emperor will kowtow three times in other words he will prostrate himself completely on the ground on the sub-zero degree temperature and then he will kowtow he will touch his head on the ground three times as he does that so nine times three prostrate times three kowtows that's how much the emperor would go to uh, express his humility and submission to this great god see this is an uh, artist uh, rendering of the emperor standing here and the chief minister and the tablet of god and a few thousand the few thousand uh, ministers and officials would be standing behind the emperor including his sons and all and this is a very interesting symbol you know in the in a christian understanding we know that the high priest it's the mediator between god and man and jesus of course is a supreme uh, example of that that he's a mediator between god and man so in ancient china when the emperor performed this sacrifice he is showing that he is the mediator and this is a stone i was talking about some of you have seen this before and more interestingly to us is the words the songs and the prayers they said during the ceremony these are not make up by me <laughs> they are all recorded it's all there you can buy the documents uh, i bought it from taiwan called the Da Min Hui Dian. okay it's called the statutes of the uh, ceremony and this is the first song it's welcome shanti it says of all in the beginning there was a great chaos without form and dark the five planets had not begun to revolve nor the two lights to shine in the midst of it there existed neither form nor sound you O sovereign spiritual sovereign came forth in your sovereignty and first did separate the impure from the pure you made heaven you made earth you made man all things became alive with reproducing power so it shows you that the ancient chinese understood that god was the creator who created this universe out of chaos sound familiar and then the sequence of it okay and then another song during the first part d lord or lord d when you separated the yin and the yang that is the heavens and the earth you your creative work had begun you did produce oh spirit the seven elements that is the sun the moon and the five planets their beautiful and brilliant lights lit up the circular sky and square earth all things were good i turn your servant thank you fearfully and while i worship present this memorial to you od calling you sovereign remember when the emperor made a proclamation to the spiritual world he referred to himself as what Zhen, the superlative i but now when he is prostrating and addressing the creator god he said what i turn the inferior me so the hierarchy is very clear it's shangdi emperor spirits even ghosts okay no need to fear ghosts all right the second part it's the offering of gems and silk and this is a song these are the words of the song that will be prayed you have promised od to hear us for you are our father again this is the intimacy 
that is expressed in ancient Chinese worship. This is not idolatry. This is a very intimate relationship with the uh, sovereign God that the emperor would call God his father and I, your child, thou and enlightened am unable to show forth my dutiful feelings. I thank you that you have accepted our pronouncement. Honourable is your great name. With reverence, we spread out these gems and silks and as swallows rejoicing in the spring, praise your abundant love. This is an expression of a very intimate relationship with God, that God is a relational God and God cares about us. He is our Father. And then, during the third part of the ceremony, the song would say, the great feast has been set forth and the sound of celebration is like thunder. The sovereign spirit promises to enjoy our offering and your servant's heart feels like a particle of dust. This is the mightiest man in his kingdom and possibly the greatest ruler of the world of that time said, I am just a speck of dust. The meat has been boiled in the large cauldron and the fragrant provisions have been prepared. Enjoy the offering, O D, then shall all the people be blessed. I, again, turn your servant and filled with thanksgiving, how blessed I am. And then the fourth part, this is the martial dance. Uh, the great and lofty one pours out his grace and love. How unworthy are we to receive it? I, his foolish servant, while I worship, hold this precious cup and praise him whose years have no end. And once again, you see the most powerful man in the kingdom humiliating himself calling himself unworthy, calling himself foolish, recognizing that he is a sinful man. And then a prayer would be offered. This is a prayer written by Jia Qin of the Ming Dynasty. And it says something like this. I'm not going to read the whole thing for you because of time. Oh, awesome creator, I look up to you. How imperial is the expansive heavens. Now is the time when the masculine energies of nature begin to be displayed and with great ceremonies, I reverently honour you. Your servant, I am but a reed or willow. My heart is but as that of an ant. Again, supreme humility. Okay. Now you understand why earlier on it was said in the Chinese uh, classics that the emperor who understands the meaning of this will know how to rule the nation because he will then be a servant to the people. When D, the Almighty, had so decreed, he called into assistance heaven, and, heaven, earth, and man. Between heaven and earth, he separated appointed men and things. But heaven has given me the mandate, so I, a servant of thee, pray for his enlightenment. So may I, a simple person, forever appear before him who is in the highest heaven. So now you see why the emperor who understands this will know how to rule the nation because he will depend on the wisdom that comes from God alone. Okay, the fifth part is a silver dance and this is what the song will say, the Tai He music. All the numerous species of living things are indebted to your grace for the beginning. Quite similar, I'm not going to read all of them. Then the sixth part of it is the presentation of the wine. And the song will say, the precious feast is white displayed. The gem-filled benches are arranged. The pearly wine is presented with music and dances. The spirit of harmony is, pre is present. Man and beast are happy. The breast of his servant, the emperor, is troubled that he is unable to repay his debts. These are all recorded in Chinese history. You can buy it and you can see it. And this is from the Ming Dynasty. Okay, the seventh part of the ceremony. The service of song is completed, but our poor sincerity cannot be expressed. Your sovereign goodness is infinite. As a porter, you have made all living things. Interesting that in the Hebrew scripture, God is also described as a porter. Great and small are shouted by your love, by inference imprinted on the heart of your poor servant is a sense of your goodness so that my feeling cannot be fully displayed. With great kindness, you do bear with us and notwithstanding our demerits, do grant us life and prosperity. So you see the justice of God 
and the grace of God. All in this. Very good theology. And then, the second to the last part, he would send uh, Shanti back to heaven. So he's called sending off Shanti. And this is what the song will say. With reverent ceremonies, the record has been presented and you, also, O Sovereign Spirit, has accepted our service. The dances have all been performed and nine times the music has responded. Grant OT your great blessing to increase the happiness of my house. So he sent Shanti back. Then the last one, interestingly, and again, if you are familiar with Hebrew sacrifice, you'll find this is a similar thing. The last part is the burnt offering. This is after Shanti was sent back to heaven, they would perform a burnt offering. And these are the words that go with that sacrifice. We have worshipped and written the great name on this gem-like sheet. Now we display it before thee and place it in the fire. These valuable offerings of silk and fine meats are burnt also with these sincere prayers, that is the prayers that are written in the silk, that they may ascend in volumes of flame up to the distant sky. At the end of the earth, look up to him, all human beings, all things on earth rejoice together in the great name. By this point, the emperor would be facing east, looking towards the cauldron, and you can imagine by now the, the sun is beginning to rise, the crack of dawn, and with that beautiful uh, uh, morning sky, you will see the burnt offering and the flames going up, and the wood would be sandalwood, wood, so it would be a very fragrant aroma. The Apostle Paul talks about a fragrant aroma, and this is that kind of a fragrant aroma. So the second evidence I've shown you, it's the border sacrifice. I have shown you uh, Chinese documentary proof and uh, the border sacrifice. The third evidence are experts, and I call them magi from the West. Just like in the court of law, I am allowed to bring in expert opinions, and I'm going to bring you some expert opinions. Um, Right before the year 2000, China rushed and completed the Millennial Hall to celebrate the new millennium. All right, during the time of Jiang Zemin, it's in Beijing, you will see it. And inside the Millennial Hall, it's called a tribute to Chinese history, Zhonghua Qian Qiu Song. It's a 117 meters long by 5 meters tall wall relief of major events and major contribution to Chinese civilization. On the wall, surprisingly, there's one foreigner, one foreigner in all of China's long history. Only one foreigner is recognized on the wall. Of course, on the wall, you have Sun Yat-sen, Mao Zedong, Zheng Jiaoping, Yao Sun, Yu, Sima Qian, Everyone you can think about, Yue Fei, all that. But one foreigner is on the wall. And that foreigner is this guy. His name is Matthew Ricci, an Italian. Not only at the Millennium Hall is he honored, he's actually honored in Beijing itself. This is right outside the second ring road. There is a cemetery. Actually, this cemetery now is occupied by the Cadre School. But inside, you will find headstones of uh, missionaries to China. These are mostly Western as well as Chinese uh, missionaries of the Jesuit order, Yesu Hui. And this place was given by the emperor to honor this missionary. But the foremost of this, it's Matthew Ricci, and you can see here is the largest headstone. Wonderful history. But I want to share with you uh, just enough to, to show you. Matthew Ricci was an Italian. He went to China, and of course his goal was to reach China. But he was also a very learned man. He became the first missionary to seriously study Chinese language and Chinese customs. He decided that he would master the Chinese classics. He became the first foreigner to Latinize Chinese words. 
all right, using Latin words. And uh, in fact, when he was, he never returned to his, uh, Italy. He died in China and, of course, was buried in the imperial tomb. Uh, when he wrote home after many years, his uh, family complained that Matteo Ricci's Italian was no longer good. Matteo Ricci and his cohorts uh, produced maps. So the People's Daily credits Ricci for the introduction of the world map, Western mathematics and astronomy to China. Matthew Ricci was famous for his memory skill. He would wow the Chinese by memorizing long poems. In fact, the story was recorded that he was at a party in Nanjing. And uh, now remember, at that time, the uh, capital was in Nanjing. So, uh, no, sorry, I'm wrong. Uh, uh, by the time of Wang Li, uh, Wan Li it was already in uh, Beijing. But, he wowed the host by looking at the poem and reciting it for him. And so the host could not believe it. He said, you must have read this poem before. So he said, okay, um, you have your guests, a few hundred of them. Everyone write a word randomly, no order, just randomly write. So they did. They wrote on a piece of paper um, the different words, any words. And he looked at it once, he put it down, and he recited it for them. So that's how sharp a mind that this man has. Actually, there's a book written about that. It's called The Memory, Memory Palace of Matthew Ricci. Simply put, this is how he would do it. You see, if I were to tell you to go to my home, my house, to my desk, on a certain drawer to say maybe I left my passport there, I can describe to you, right? I will tell you, go to my house, go to the room on the right side, and to the left side, you will see my desk, and on the second drawer, if you pull open it, you will see my passport. So the, the, the Jesuits, and especially Richie, would form all these palaces in their mind, and they will file their information that way. So they will always remember uh, what they have memorized. But anyway, I want to share this with you to let you see that this was a man who made clocks. One day was fascinated by his clocks. This is a man who drew maps. This is a man who taught mathematics. This is a man who Latinized languages. He is a foremost scholar and academic. All right? Let's establish that. But this is a conclusion. After he studied Chinese classics, this is what he said, He who is called Lord of Heaven in my humble country is he who is called Shangdi in Chinese. Matthew Ricci, after having a chance to work in the imperial palace, reading the documents, seeing the sacrifice, concluded that the ancient Chinese worshipped the God, same as the God in the Bible. This is what he wrote in Chinese. And... This is uh, in the same book. He said, therefore, having lived through a great number of ancient books, meaning Chinese books, it is quite clear to me that the sovereign on high and the Lord of heaven are different only in name. Some people will say, well, you know, he had an ulterior motive. He wanted to convert Chinese, so he just twisted it. But think about it. You are a scientist. You are a scholar. Would you sacrifice your integrity to convert someone, will you lie to evangelize? I don't think so. He had no need to do that. All right, this is a man of great integrity. I will share this with you. The foremost expert on the Jesuit in China today is uh, Professor Yi San Li, a friend of mine. Once I was in conversation with him, I said, what do you think of these missionaries? Because, you know, the official position of the missionaries was missionaries came to China to subvert China. They were there to do bad things. So I said, what do you think of these Jesuits? Because he is the chief expert on the Jesuits. He is the curator of the, the cemetery that I uh, referred to early. He went to Italy. He went to Belgium and all the places where uh, the, the missionaries were formed and studied them. So I said, Professor Yi, what do you think of this man? He raised his thumb. He said, these are men of men, ren shan ren. These are men of the highest caliber. Okay, that's what he said. So I said, 
Professor E, if that is true, and these are your heroes, do you believe what they believe in? He kind of smiled and said, maybe we can talk about that another time. But the point is that, that this man, a man of the highest caliber, came to this conclusion. You can either believe him or disregard him and throw him off the wall on the Millennial Hall. You cannot honour a liar. Okay. Now, just to show you that these are men of integrity. They, he had actually led quite a few mean uh, ministers to Jesus. And one of them is Paul Xu Guangqi, okay, the chief minister of the Ming dynasty during Wan Li period. But there were a few others that Richie refused to baptize. And the reason why he refused to baptize them was in those days, these officials would have many wives he would refuse to baptize them because they have more than one wives. And there was one of the uh, Liang Zizhao, he only baptized him on his deathbed when he renounced his concubines. My point here is that this man, Matthew Ritchie, would not compromise to win converts. Okay, another person, now a Protestant, and an uh, expert, and I, I talked about him, uh, James Lake, he was considered the foremost Chinese expert, or some foremost expert on Chinese in the 19th century. And this is uh, the classics, and I talked about the annotation and the commentaries. This is what I got. And if you really want to study how they come to those uh, interpretations, you can uh, study this. And this is said of him at his memorial service. If ever man loved a people, James Lake loved the Chinese. And he could not bear to see them do wrong or suffer it. The longest and the most embittered controversy in which he was ever engaged was one with certain missionaries who did not think of the root ideas of the old Chinese religion as he did. There was a huge controversy in the 19th century, actually between the British and the American missionaries. The British missionaries like James Lake and Mel Hurst actually had better scholarship. The American missionaries did not have the same scholarship, so they came, to the, they, they came with an idea that the Chinese could not have known God. So they refused to use the Chinese term Shang Ti for God. That's why nowadays you will find two versions of the Chinese Bible when it comes to the use of God. You have the Shang Ti Ban, okay, the Shang Ti version versus the Shen version. And the British missionaries say, we can use Shang Ti because Shang Ti is the same as our God. They say, oh no, it's like calling God Su Kong, you know. No. Of course, nowadays you don't see that uh, argument, but in those days it was fierce. Okay. And, and uh, Fabian continued to say, nominally it related to the question whether they had any word meaning Shangti, that could be used to translate the idea of God really and substantially. It concerned whether they had any idea of God at all. And he maintained, James Lake maintained, they had, for he did not judge with charity as well as, not, for he did, for did he not judge with charity as well as knowledge. Just to show you the esteem and the position of James Lake had in the world of the, the, the sinologists or experts on China. Even 30 years after James Lake's death, a Congress of Oriental Languages was held in, at Oxford in 1928. During the conference, a representation of professors from countries such as France, Italy, Holland, Germany, Latvia, America and Canada laid a reef on his grave on the card attached to the reef was written, to the immortal genius of the great master James Lake, from the Sinologies assembled at the 17th Congress of Orientalists at Oxford, August 31, 1928. So I have established his scholarship and his genius. So now, this is his conclusion. James Lake said, I maintain that the Chinese do know the true God and have a word in their language answering to our word God, 
to the Hebrew Elohim and to the Greek Theos. And then finally, all truth is God's truth. And this has to do with extra events. And the Chinese was meticulous in recording extra phenomena. The emperors would hire 14 court astronomers who would study the night sky every night and record events. But not only recording them, they would interpret them. Because the ancient Chinese believe that you can observe the heavens to discern changes. Now, this is different from astrology. Astrology say the stars will, change, will control your life. But the Chinese concept is similar to the uh, Hebrew concept, like in Psalm 19, 诸天俗说神的荣耀, 穷餐传言他的手段. All right, the heavens de declare the glory of God. Day from day, it declare, uh, uh, show forth his handiwork. So the ancient Chinese also believe that God who flung the stars into the space could communicate with humans through the stars because God is a community of God. You can communicate with emails, you can communicate with a written word, but you can communicate with flowers. So don't forget to buy your wife's uh, Mother's Day gifts tomorrow. But so the Chinese said, observe the heavenly bodies to discern the changes of the ages. Observe humanity to teach people and govern the world. So these are some things that they discovered during the name, uh, the reign of Tianpin during the early Han Dynasty, which was, uh, he reigned about 7th to the 1 BC. In the second month of the second year, the comet out of Altair was out of Altair for more than 70 days. It is said, comets appear to signify the old being replaced by the new. Or tear, the sun, the moon, and the five stars are in movement to signify the beginning of a new epoch, the beginning of a new year, a new month, and a new day. The appearance of this comet undoubtedly symbolizes change. The extended appearance of this comet indicates that this is of great Importance. Now, comet is a loose translation of the Chinese word, okay? So don't uh, assume that it's same as your understanding of a comet. And this is the original Chinese uh, record. Remember, they would meticulously record these uh, extra phenomena. And the second month of the second year of Emperor Tianpin would be around 5 BC, March 9. To about April 6. All right, I cannot be clear, sure. So it's roughly that period of time. Then another record of the same event in the second year of Tianpin of Emperor uh, Xiao Ai, that is his uh, reign title, in the spring, the first month, a Bay comet was found at Altair. What is important is that they will interpret this event, and their interpretation is that this has to do with a perfect sacrifice. Now, if you compare that with biblical record, this would be, say, around the time of the star from the east that showed the Magi how to find uh, Jesus. And what did Jesus come for? Jesus came to die for us on the cross. Jesus came to sacrifice, and he was the perfect sacrifice. Now, this is independent of Hebrew records. All this I'm telling you, we all know that China and Israel had no interactions in the ancient times. I'm not saying that the Chinese had read the Bible. They were certainly not influenced the Bible. But whether it was the Genesis record or the extra events, they saw them independently. And more importantly, they interpreted them consistent with the Bible. Then 13 months later, you will recall that in the Bible, after the Magi arrived in Jerusalem, apparently the, the first star in the east disappeared. That's why they had to ask around. And then after they left Herod, they found the, the star of Bethlehem. So in the Chinese record, about 13 months after the previous record, it was said that on Yu day of the third month of the third year, remember now this is the 
early on was the second month of the second year. Now it's the third month for the third year of Jianping. There appeared a bow star at Aquila. Thirteen months later. Now, probably it took the Magi that many months to move from the east to Jerusalem. That's why in the Bible, the biblical record, when King Herod heard that about this new king to be born, he was uh, tricked by the Magi because the Magi did not come back to see him. So he was angry. And what did he do? He ordered all the children in Bethlehem, two years and under, to be killed. Why two years? Because probably the Magi, and of course it's not in the Bible, but in the Chinese record, told us that it was 13 months later. So the emperor killed everyone two years and under. Then, of course, uh, in the Bible, we have uh, another extra phenomenon on the day of the cross. There was a huge darkness that lasted a long time. Around the same time, which would be 33 years after those two events that I have just shown you, in the day of Kui Hai, this would be in the later Han Dynasty. Of course, you, you know Chinese history, you know that the Han Dynasty was broken up by the Wang Mang uh, Rebellion, who established a short Xing Dynasty. But the later Han, 33 years later, the last day of the month, there was a solar eclipse. The, the sky turned dark, all right? They call it eclipse. The emperor avoided entering the throne room withheld all military activities and did not handle business, official business for five days. And he made an official pronouncement that my poor character has caused this calamity, that the sun and the moon were veiled. I am fearing and trembling. What else can I say? Anyone who presents a memorial, in other words, anyone who presents a mem memo to me, is not allowed to mention the word holy. You see, whenever they present a memo to, Shang, uh, to the emperor, they would call him holy. So he's saying, don't call me holy at this time. And this is the original Chinese uh, record. You can find it in the uh, Chinese historical record. And more importantly, there was a response to this event. So it was recorded summer. So a short time later, fourth month of the year, on the day of Ren Wu, the imperial edict reads, Yin and Yang have mistakenly switched, and the sun and the moon were eclipsed. This is fantastic. This is their conclusion. The sins of all the people are now on one man. The emperor proclaims pardon to all under heaven. They had no idea of the crucifixion that happened in Jerusalem. But this was recorded around that time, and they came to the conclusion that the sins of all the people are now on one man. Whether you believe this to be referring to Jesus, the very least that you have to conclude is that the ancient Chinese believe that one man can die for the sins of all the people. Then, there was a, a commentary, an interpretation. The record of the later Han Dynasty commentator Qian Tan Ba said, Eclipse on the day of Kui Hai, that eclipse that we read about, means that the man from heaven dies. Again, whether you believe this relates to the Bible, you still have to answer the question, who is this man from heaven? And the Chinese word is Tian Ren Peng. Peng is a special word referring to death of the emperor, the king. So in other words, this heavenly man is also the king. So you still have to answer, who is this man? Interestingly, the Chinese uh, has this rec uh, recorded. And then finally, very quickly, five minutes, I'm going to rush through this. Words have meaning. Uh, the Chinese language is a very unique language in the world. It's the one of its kind in the whole world because the Chinese character is iconic. It is a picture. Now, you have second generation in the United States. You want them to study Chinese. What is their complaint? It's too hard, mom, too hard, dad. 
I don't want to memorize all those Chinese words. So because of that, all the other languages of the world had gone phonetic, like English and Spanish or German or Latin. They use alphabets. Now, the, the advantage of alphabets, of course, is that it helps you to write and remember easily. But what is happening with that is that after a while, phonetic words will change because when people pronounce a word differently, you have to write it differently. Whereas in, in uh, Chinese language, uh, the meaning of the word is embedded in the symbol. Uh, and we, we know that we have good uh, sources because of the uh, oracle bones, uh, 55,000 fragments, and the uh, bronze inscriptions, 12,000 pieces. And we, we know that Chinese characters throughout the ages evolve, but not substantially, you can recognize it. If you have a chance, go to the internet or the museum to look at the original version of the King James Bible. You will not be able to read it, even though it is in English, because the spelling is different than what it is today. But amazingly, we can read some of the oracle born inscriptions and recognize them a few thousand years ago because the meaning is embedded. And we also know that the Chinese uh, characters develop independently of the languages of the Near East. And with Chinese characters, there are three types, pictographs, ideograms, and phonetics. I'm not going to go through that. But with an ideogram, it's interesting because ideogram puts uh, ideas together to tell you to express an idea. For example, this is a sign for what? Danger, right? It doesn't mean that there is a power of uh, 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 bones there. It means that don't get near here, you'll become like that. Um, and this is another illustration. The Rosetta Stone uh, is a great discovery because for a few hundred years, the ancient, uh, ancient Egyptian language was lost to the world. When people see those uh, figures on uh, Egyptian monuments, they thought they were just pictures. They had no idea that it was actually a language until they found the Rosetta Stone, which put the ancient Egyptian language along with Greek and the intermediate language. So from the Greek, they have been able to decipher the ancient language because it is an iconic or a pictogram. So, and finally, embedded meaning of the icons. This is a very, uh, these are two very uh, famous symbols. It is now accepted throughout the world. And if you do not know what it means, it would be very bad for you. You need to use the restroom because you need to find out whether you're going to the male or the female restroom. Right on the left is the uh, restroom for females and the right is uh, restroom for men. Now, these symbols do not need to change anymore because it has taken hold. So a few thousand years later, we'll probably be seeing these symbols. Now, just imagine, 4,000 years later, women no longer wear skirt or blouse. Women all wear dress like men. But our descendants will be able to look at that and say, wow, you know what? Our ancestors, the female ancestors, wore something like this, a triangle, you know, a dress. So this is with Chinese words. We are able to get into the minds of Chinese a few thousand years ago by studying these words. And I don't have time to share all these words with you, but I just want to relate that I didn't... Sometimes we are accused of saying, ah, you are interpreting it this way because you are a Christian. I say yes, in a sense, but it is not just that. I can recognize them quicker than you because I have another ancient uh, reference, the Hebrew scripture. It would just be like coming to America. How many of you are Cantonese? Very few. Okay, good. One. The rest of you, when you go to McDonald's and you buy French fries for your children, they will always ask you, do you want ketchup? Now, those of you who are not Cantonese would not think of ketchup as a Chinese word. It is. Because the Cantonese pronounce tomato sauce as ketchup. It's true. So, if you're not a Cantonese, you will not recognize that 
catch up is a Chinese word. Walk is another one. You know, the northern Chinese pronounce it as guo, but Cantonese call it walk. So the English word walk comes from Cantonese. Anyway, so yeah, it is true. Because I'm a Christian, I have the Hebrew scripture of this, about the same history. That's why I can recognize this. But it is not just that. Because there are other archaeological discoveries. This is one of the most exciting archaeological discoveries of modern China. They discovered this civilization in Sichuan province in a place called San Xin Tui, Three Star Mount. And they found hundreds of bronze articles. And they uh, dated these bronze articles, uh, especially this uh, tree, to be about 27 to 4,700 years old. And the civilization there, they estimated to be as large as 3 million people. And they found this bronze tree. It's, a giant, it's, a, it's like a life-size tree, 3.95 meter tall. Okay, it's a more than two-story high. And on it, there are fruit that are protected by life, light leaves. And then it is inhabited by a snake. And then it has a human hand. So very quickly, um, you will see that this tree has a snake. See that? Uyghurs down here. And this snake has two front legs. All right, before the Bible tells us before the fall, the snake has feet. And these are the protected fruits. You can see beautiful fruit, but they're protected by life's night uh, uh, leaves. And, and so it shows you it's like a forbidden fruit. And, and you see a hand, a human hand, touching the tree and the snake. So out of that, when I look at words like tin, Forbidden, I see two trees and God. I see the word for ta, the third person, the it, which originally in Chinese, it's the same word for the snake. All right, this is ta, is the uh, ancient script for snake. Of course, now snake to be distinguished added a radical, a classifier to make it a snake. And then to cover it is two trees and a woman and so forth. And I'm going to stop here because of time. Uh, is that going to be a question and answer time? or My time is up, but I'm open to questions and answer. And in case you're interested to contact me, this is my contact information. Any questions or should I close? Yeah, I introduce myself. I'm from Singapore. I'm a fourth generation Chinese. I grew up in a traditional Chinese family. And I became a Christian when I was 19. But before that, I, I was in idol worship and all that. Uh, when I became a Christian when I was 19, in 1974, I thought I had to give up my, Christian, my, my Chinese heritage. I thought I turned my back on my culture until my wife and I relocated to Beijing in 1987. No, sorry, went to China in 1987, but relocated to Beijing in 1995. And when people come to Beijing, they will always want to see the Great Wall, the Forbidden City, and the Temple of Heaven. And I hated to go to the Temple of Heaven because when I was a kid, I didn't want to go to temples. So at first I thought, oh, temple, no good. But as I went with my friends, I made discoveries and this leads me to a journey. I, I spent more than 10 years on this. I spent seven years to write my book. But these are some of the things I've discovered along the way to show me that the ancient Chinese worship a one true God who shares the same character as the God of the Bible. The last emperors of the Ming Dynasty actually became a Christian. Chong uh, Zhen, uh, one of his wives, became a Christian and she was Christianized Helena. Um, but there was a controversy uh, during the Qing Dynasty. Um, a long story, but very quickly, you all may have heard it called the rights controversy, Li Yi Zhen. The problem was that the Jesuits were using this method 
and they were quite successful and they were elevated. Uh, I didn't share with you, Nan Huai Ren were beast, a Belgian uh, uh, missionary, became the personal tutor of the greatest Chinese emperor, Kang Xi. Okay, Kang Xi was tutored by the beast. That's why Kang Xi became the longest serving emperor since Qin Shi Huang. Uh, he reigned for 52 years. And before he died, he actually wrote a memorial. He said, all the emperors before me, if they reign for long, they will become corrupt. If they remain good, usually they die young. Which is true, right? If you look at the long years of history, they all became corrupt when they ruled for long. And Kang Xi became emperor when he was nine years old. He ruled with, he was ruled, I mean, the, the regions uh, ruled for him until he became 14. At 14 years old, Kang Xi became the most powerful man in the empire. But in the end, we still consider Kang Xi one of probably the best emperor in all of Chinese history. I will submit to you there is a reason, because he was tutored by the Jesuit priests. That was how effective they were. But anyway, after Kang Xi died, this controversy broke out. The Franciscans and the Dominicans were also in China now. And a lot of it was because of the, the, the Jesuits were so successful, the door was wide open. But the Franciscans and the, uh, the, the Dominicans were ministering to the poor people. And they didn't see some of these things. So they, they actually discredited the, the Jesuits. They, they wrote to the Pope and complained and said that the Jesuits had syncretized the faith by mixing Chinese religion with uh, the, the Christian religion. So that's why it was called a rights controversy. Long story short, the Pope wrote a very stern letter to the emperor and, and the emperor was furious. Kang Xi actually scolded the emissary from the Pope. He said, you don't even speak Chinese and you're trying to lecture me which was actually very arrogant because Kang Xi was one of the most learned emperors of all times, right? We all know that. The Kang Xi Da Zi Dian, right? The Kang Xi Dictionary was his masterpiece. But this guy was trying to lecture Kang Xi and Kang Xi actually wrote letters to the Pope to explain that when he worshipped God, uh, he worshipped the Supreme Being and, and this and that. But I won't get into that. So, as a result, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, Yongzhen was not a very good emperor. He dispelled uh, the missionaries, but leaving behind uh, uh, the, the, the Jesuits. So, in a sense, the Catholics lost a golden opportunity. And then, uh, it, it's that relationship between the Vatican and China actually continued to, to, to this day. Uh, it has never been good. And then, uh, I shared with you about James Lake, same thing. Uh, the, the British missionaries were of higher scholarship, but the Americans came with their preconceived ideas, would not believe, would not agree. It was actually based on ignorance. They've never read this. You know, it seemed like when I share this, sometimes people will object. But that's because they never examined the text like I have done. Good. I think that's good enough, uh, Vin. Thank you all for your attention.